Kelly. Recording in progress. It doesn't say that in the bag of town, sorry. So, Patitam Padayor Vira Kripaya Dinavatsalaha Saranyo Navidic Chiloka Ahachedam Hasaneva. Translation Maharaj Parikshit, who was qualified to accept surrender and worthy of being sung in history, did not kill the poor surrendered and fallen Kali, but smiled compassionately. For he was kind to the poor. Purport by his divine grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada. Even an ordinary Kshatriya does not kill a surrendered person. I want to speak of Maharaj Parikshit, who was by nature compassionate and kind to the poor. He was smiling because the artificially dressed Kali had disclosed his identity as a lower class man. And he was thinking how ironic it is that although one was saved from his sharp sword when he desired to kill, the poor lower class Kali was spared by his timely surrender. Maharaj Pariksit's glory and kindness are therefore sung in history. He was a kind and compassionate emperor, fully worthy of accepting surrender even from his enemy. Thus, the personality of Kali was saved by the will of Providence. And then the king says, The king thus said, We have inherited the fame of Arjun. Therefore, since you have surrendered yourself with folded hands, you need not fear for your life. But you cannot remain in my kingdom, for you are the friend of irreligion. Report. The personality of Kali, who is the friend of all kinds of irreligiosities, may be excused if he surrenders, but in all circumstances he cannot be allowed to live as a citizen in any part of the welfare state. The Pandavas were entrusted representatives of the personality of Godhead, Lord Krishna, who practically brought into being the battle of Kurukshetra but not for any personal interest. He wanted an ideal, an ideal king like Maharaj Yudhisthira and his descendants like Maharaj Parikshit to rule the world. And therefore, a responsible king like Maharaj Parikshit could not allow the friend of irreligiosity to flourish in his kingdom at the cost of the good fame of the Pandavas. That is the way of wiping out corruption in the state and not otherwise. The friends of irreligiosity should be banished from the state and that will save the state from corruption. So there's no, um, there's no mincing of words here. If you want to uh, save the state from corruption, and um, do we know a single state on the planet where corruption is not prominent? I don't think there is one. I don't think in the entire world, I don't think there's a single country where corruption is not the norm. But here, the prophet is saying, that is the way of wiping out corruption in the state and not otherwise. The friends of irreligiosity should be banished from the state. That will save the state from corruption. And do we have any country in the world again where there is not irreligiosity, where it is not prominent, in spite of the fact that everybody, at least externally, on the face of it, show allegiance to a Supreme Lord? Just like we have cited many times, the United States dollar has in God we trust printed on the dollar, stamped in all the coins. And Prabhupada pointed out on many occasions when he was in New York and Los Angeles or giving talks from America, that it's just in name only that people are 
swearing allegiance to God and God we trust. First of all, Prabhupada used to say, they don't know who God is. They may say they trust God, but there is nothing to show that they have any indication of who God is. We are bringing knowledge of God. We are bringing knowledge of the Supreme. Prabhupada cited on many occasions. We know what God looks like. We know what he eats. We know his address. We know where he lives. We know everything about him. And these people who are claiming to know about God, they know absolutely nothing. Prabhupada didn't mince his words. Prabhupada was very bold. Uh, it doesn't mean then that we're uh, bold in the same sense as Prabhupada, but if we repeat verbatim whatever Prabhupada told us, that is just as good as Prabhupada said. And Prabhupada gave the example many times. Again, we can only repeat what we learn from Prabhupada and what we read from his books. He gave the example of the postman. The postman is delivering the letter. He may be delivering a letter which is containing uh, bad news or good news. He may be telling you that uh, you've won the lottery in the letter. He may be telling you that you've uh, underpaid on your electricity bill. Whatever the case may be, you cannot blame the postman for delivering the letter. It's not the postman's business to open the letter and interpret it or misinterpret it as the case may be. It's the postman's business simply to deliver the letter. So the, uh, the whole chain of the cyclic succession is delivering the message of, of Lord Krishna as it was spoken to the sun god, Vimasvan. And then later, as Krishna explained to Arjuna in the fourth chapter of the Gita, I spoke this to the sun god, now I'm speaking it to you, unchanged, without a single slightest change. So the, the, the whole message of the Vedas, the whole message of the Sampradaya is simply to help us to understand that the only business in life we have is to surrender to the Lord, surrender to his instructions. That is the only thing that will make us happy. There was um, long before Prabhupada came to the West, 10 years before, in fact, um, you may recall from reading in the Leela Amrita, Prabhupada started uh, what he, what he uh, an, an, another society before ISKCON. He started the League of Devotees. You remember reading that in, in, in the Leela Amrita and in, in the um, A Lifetime in Preparation. And that was big, it was quite successful. It wasn't a small thing, but it wasn't, it didn't take off with the same dynamic fervor uh, that ISKCON took off uh, later in 1966 in New York. But still, there were Prabhupada had disciples. Uh, I forget the name of his first Prabhupada. Prabhupada Prakash was his first disciple. But anyway, um, Prabhupada started the League of Devotees. He set out the terms and uh, conditions under which he was forming the League. And uh, one of the main things, that was in October 1956, but Prabhupada started the League of the Voice. Prabhupada was thinking way ahead, way, way ahead. And he had planned the entire strategy. He hadn't yet gained his, uh, his papers for traveling to America. He would no idea or no means even of how he was going to travel. But his, the plan was still, uh, was, was still cooking in his mind how to do this, how to implement the order of my guru. That was his whole life, his whole life and soul, how to imp implement the order, the instruction of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Maharaj. Prabhupada was thinking of nothing else, even though it appears from an external point of view that uh, there was a lot of dormant periods of time in Prabhupada's life. There wasn't a single second. How many lectures have we listened to? I've listened to dozens of lectures where devotees were falling asleep in Prabhupada's class, Prabhupada's, wake up, don't waste time. And in the first record Prabhupada made in 1966 in New York, a famous record where he was talking about uh, one can chant the holy names of the Lord in any state of mind, in any condition, even a dog can participate. Prabhupada says the whole idea in this human form of life is to not waste a second. 
not a single second. So Prabhupada said, uh, uh, one of the um, conditions under which Prabhupada formed a league of devotees was, I can quote this, to evoke the qualities of goodness, particularly sattva gun, in every member of the league, individually, by the process of spiritual initiation, diksha, this is Prabhupada writing this, giving very clear, detailed instruction. Uh, and later, of course, he actually put this into practice, the same thing, not a single shred of difference when he formed ISKCON in, in New York. By giving, by the process of spiritual initiation, by establishing the candidate in the status of a qualified Brahmin. This is what Prabhupada wanted. He wanted a, a society of Brahmins, good and intellectual men. That was the way Prabhupada described the term Brahman, good and intellectual men on the basis of truthfulness. Well, that was the first thing, truthfulness. And what was the second? That was interesting. Forgiveness. Forgiveness is the second. Equality, tolerance, education, purity, knowledge, specific and general knowledge, specific and general. And faith in the transcendental service of Godhead. That was the main criteria, faith in the transcendental service of Godhead. Because if we don't have faith in what we're doing, why do it? Why bother? Why go through the motions of uh, this whole process of sadhana bhakti if we don't have faith? If the faith is not there, or we don't understand, or we don't get an inkling of what is the end product, if we can call it that. And what 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 creates this faith? How do we develop this faith? It doesn't just come out of nowhere, out of the blue, out of the sky. It comes from our, our interaction with other devotees, first of all, by reading the scriptures and by interacting with devotees, devotees who have experienced, in our case, at least, we have met uh, devotees who were directly servants of Srila Prabhupada. For the most part, most of us have taken initiation from these disciples of, from the early days of Prabhupada's uh, journey in, in, in the Western countries. So we have, to, we have taken the faith that they have taken. They've passed on their faith, and their faith was directly uh, uh, shown and exhibited by Srila Prabhupada. So they've taken it on. So first of all, without the faith, then nothing will happen. But faith in what? In the transcendental service of Godhead. That is the ultimate goal, to have this transcendental service of Godhead. And Prabhupada went on to describe in the League of Devotees, he was quoting from Krishnadas Kaviraj, who mentioned the whole list of the 26 qualities of a devotee. And Prabhupada lists those in the League of Devotees. And they're they appear at first glance to be insurmountable, unobtainable, impossible to achieve. But over a period of time, we can see that slowly, 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 we actually imbibe these qualities. And without at least making the effort, even if we have not taken on these qualities, if, we, if we've not even made the effort to take them on, then what's the point of going through the externals of being a devotee? Putting on tilak, wearing a dhoti, wearing a sari, and uh, you know, going through the motions of temple activities and temple life and association. If we have not taken on the 26 qualities of a devotee, then Prabhupada says, the rest is just show bottle. Srila Prabhupada wanted to create a society of devotees who exhibited first-class character and behavior. Now that may be asking a lot. It is asking a lot because we're completely submerged in this ocean of Maya. We're completely submerged in this, this ocean of Tamas. And that's what the, the whole material world is. Prabhupada describes from the highest places, Ramalok, down to the lowest place, all are places of ignorance. So why would the earth planet be any different? So Prabhupada says, um, we want to uh, create a society of those who exhibited first-class character and behavior, particularly 
the Brahminical qualities of goodness. My, 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 my very good friend who I, um, I asked to, uh, I think it was last year, I asked him to give one class um, that he gave uh, to the group, uh, Danishvar Prabhu, uh, an old disciple of Srila Prabhupada. And uh, he's writing a book right now. I'm helping him to, to edit it, probably be coming out uh, early next year. And it's about the gunas, very simple, goodness, passion, and ignorance. And it's describing how the, go the gunas interact in this whole material world and how they affect everything that's going on in this world, on this planet. And also not only explaining, not only explaining the gunas, but also explaining how we can overcome these gunas, even the, the, uh, the goodness guna how we can even overcome that and get to the say to the stage of uh, sattvas completely and total beyond the stage of even goodness because we can also become attached to goodness but if 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 we had this this planet submerged only in goodness then of course we'd be laughing but we don't for the most part it's tamasic completely tamasic with a, a tiny sprinkling of rajas but for the most part, it's completely tamasic with no hint of goodness whatsoever. It's gone, completely gone. But Prabhupada wants to want us as Brahmins, even if we're not you know, wearing a Brahmin thread, at least our aspiration should be not the formality of taking on a Brahmin or being initiated as a Brahmin. That's one thing. But imbibe the culture, the the qualities of a Brahman. And the first quality is to be submerged in the quality of goodness, as outlined in the Bhagavad Gita and uh, in, in the 18th chapter. These qualities are possessed by what Prabhupada called a good and intellectual man. So when Prabhupada formed a society in 1966, his specific instruction, particularly to Brahmananda, Brahmananda was the first temple president in ISKCON, the first secretary of ISKCON, and he's the one who signed the, the incorporation papers along with his brother Gargamuni. And um, Gargamuni was the first treasurer. Uh, Prabhupada said, <laughs> we'll call him, and Gargamuni, if you wanted to get a single cent from Gargamuni, you had to have a good story. Prabhupada used to call him guard the money. So because he was so tight with the money, but that's what Prabhupada wanted because this money can only be used in the service of Krishna. No room for Maya, no room for, you know, borrowing a dollar from the treasury. And as the devotees were doing in the early days and sneaking out the back door and going to the, the donut shop down the road. And Prabhupada would be passing by and the devotees would slide, slide down and hide behind the table in case Prabhupada would see them eating their donuts. Prabhupada called them do nuts because Prabhupada didn't know how to pronounce donuts because that's the way it's written in New York, donuts. They don't write D-O-U-G-H, they write D-O nuts. So Prabhupada was wondering, what is do nuts? And then the devotees had to explain to them. But of course the devotees, it took them a while to overcome this idea you can eat anything and everything. So the devotees were, you know, it took them a while to get used to this idea. In fact, Satrup Maharaj told me he when Satrup Maharaj, he was initiated in the second batch of devotees because he was too shy. He didn't appear for the first initiation. He appeared on the second initiation. And he told me that the devotees, they, they, they just didn't have a clue. We weren't even asked by Prabhupada in the early days, even at initiation time, we weren't even asked about what are the four regulative principles. That's standard today. Of course, everybody, when you're taking initiation at the fire, you're asked to state that while you're, before you're given your name, what are the four regulative principles, what you promise to do, chant 16 rounds and so on. And then you're given your beads and your name. But that wasn't the case. And Prabhupada was very, very gentle. He didn't want to upset people and drive them away. 
Imagine the whole Western civilization is based on breaking the four regulative principles. So Robert said, no illicit sex, no meat eating, no gambling, no intoxication. And then you can come and visit me in the temple. Who would have come? Who would have joined? So gradually, 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 Prabhupada introduced these minor rules and regulations. But then <laughs> uh, Brahmananda told me, when the first Akadashi came around, and, I mean, they didn't observe Akadashi. The first two or three or four or five or six Akadashis weren't observed at all. Prabhupada observed them. But Prabhupada was now getting people addicted to prasadam. That was the drug that was bringing them in. They weren't really into the philosophy, a little bit into the chanting, but the prasadam, everybody and Prabhupada used to do all the cooking. So you imagine how brilliant a cook Srila Prabhupada is. So then the, when, it, when, it, when it became a little more formalized and the devotees introduced, uh, Prabhupada introduced the idea of fasting on a Kadashi, then, of course, there was, <laughs> there was some maneno. So um, Brahmananda told me that they were out. They didn't have Back to Godhead printed. Prabhupada used to print Back to Godhead in New York from 1944. Prabhupada started printing long before he went to America. So the continuation when he went to New York was more formalized. It was more classical and uh, more streamlined. And then he got this full color edition of Back to Godhead that he printed every month. But that came much, much later. In 1966, I don't know if any of you remember, Prabhupada got a, a Xerox machine and they would photostat the, the pages that they would type up and some or other stick a picture on it and maybe this rough, rough, rough back to Godhead that they stapled together in the basement of 26 Second Avenue. That's all they had. And then the devotees would go out and distribute those around the East Village, the part of New York where the 26 Second Avenue is. So, uh, and they bring back a few cents in donations, not very much five or six dollars a day and that was it it was it was like very very simple life but then um, Prabhupada did all the cooking the devotees are out on the street six seven eight ten hours a day distributing the xerox back to godhead bringing back whatever little amount of donations they could get but they were fully surrendered to Prabhupada they didn't think about anything else they were totally dedicated Prabhupada had this impact on their life that was instant it was immediate so then at the end of the day they'd come back Prabhupada would do the cooking and they would enjoy the evening meal and then they would have their evening RT and so on and so forth take rest and get up the next morning so they came one day and Prabhupada got just got absorbed completely absorbed in the translations of his books forgot about cooking completely forgot and brahmananda i don't know if you've met brahmananda or if you've seen them or you've seen pictures of him he's big <laughs> brahmananda's big i mean i'm 100 kilos brahmananda must have been 200 kilos i mean he was big and uh and his brother is the same but um they came back and brahmananda he could eat you know 50 chapatis in the sitting without any problem. And Prabhupada would encourage him to do to eat, 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 because that was what was keeping him going. But Prabhupada had forgot to cook. <laughs> nothing was there. Absolutely nothing. They all came back starving. So Prabhupada says, Oh, I forgot to cook. So Prabhupada ran into the kitchen and he cooked this tiny little it was about fifteen devotees, cooked this tiny little pot of halva because it's quick and <laughs> and the brahmanad is looking at this pot <laughs> Prabhupada, Prabhupada went around with a with a tablespoon <laughs> handing out hold out your hand and they all held out their hand <laughs> put a, a tablespoon of halva in each person and brahmanad is looking at this what am i supposed to do with this <laughs> and uh, Prabhupada said eat <laughs> so that was how that was all he could cook so quickly and Brahmananda told me, he said, I was instantly filled. I've never been so satisfied in my life. 
and that one tablespoon of halwa. So this this was the mood. This was this was the energy that Prabhupada gave out. Prabhupada was a Vaikuntha man, straight from Goloka Vrindavan. So this is what Prabhupada could do. So then Prabhupada gradually, gradually introduced these rules about Akadashi and fasting. And then, of course, the first Janmastami, <laughs> fasting till midnight. Hmm, midnight. Wow. And what are you going to do at midnight? You're supposed to be sleeping. So there's a whole, it was gradual, gradual. But Prabhupada was very tolerant, very patient. And look at the result now. So then... Prabhupada started to introduce the qualities of a Brahmin, the qualities of a devotee. And uh, they're wonderful, Prabhupada says in uh, <coughs> Chaitanya Charitamrita, in one purport, Krishna Nas Kaviraj, the author of Chaitanya Charitamrita, says that all good qualities become manifest in the body of a Vaishnava. All good qualities become manifest in the body of a Vaishnava. And that only the presence of these good qualities can one distinguish a Vaishnav from a non-Vaishnav. And then Krishnadas Kaviraj goes on to list these 26 good qualities of a devotee. And uh, I was very fortunate that uh, my spiritual master, he wrote a book called The 26 Qualities of a Devotee. And I... I put that book through production, so we we were absorbed at the time in discussing each quality. And Krishnadas Kaviraj describes them as he's very kind to everyone, number one. He does not make anyone his enemy. Number two, he is truthful, number three, he's equal to everyone. No one can find any fault in him, number five, number six. He is magnanimous. Seven, he is mild. Eight, he is always clean. Nine, he is without possessions. I mean, just that one, he is always clean. Again, Satrup Maharaj and Brahmananda, they used to tell me that you know, Prabhupada would get so angry if devotees didn't wash their hands. Because again, hippie society, Western society, practically living on the street, and, uh, you know, no, nobody cares about anything. And the whole idea of being a hippie is that you, you reject all the qualities of the mainstream society and you do your own thing. And, you know, everybody hardly ever taking bath or washing or cleaning. So probably go around and probably <laughs> slap their hands. Uh, you haven't washed. Or if you touch the deity, after touching your ear or your hair, and it, probably was, I remember when um, when I first went on the altar after we had installed the deities in Ireland, Radha Krishna, Radha Madhava, and uh, I was made the pujari. I I didn't know anything about anything. I was trained by a Prabhupada disciple, Ishashvini. She trained trained me how to. Uh, at least do some kind of a puja or, or dress the deities or bathe them in the morning and everything. Else. And whenever I do anything wrong, wow, she would just slap me. <laughs> uh, no, you can't touch your nose. You can't touch your hair. And this is all, all new for me. But just that quality of cleanliness. And then you not only develop a quality of cleanliness, it's something you do with second nature after some time of engaging with devotees who come second. But for us, coming in off the street, becoming, trying to become devotees, joining the temple, we do nothing about these things. A cleanliness part of goodness. If you're clean inside and out, and gradually, gradually, these qualities, they, they become second nature. And gradually, before you know it, wow, who knows? You become a devotee. You know, it's like, wow. Yesterday I was doing this, engaging in all these abominable activities, and today, wow, why was I doing all those things? Then you kind of look in the past, you say, wow, how on earth did I live such a life? But it's not like if you were to introduce all these rules and regulations immediately, who could follow? Especially us coming from Western countries, we know nothing about Brahminical culture, but Prabhupada was very, very patient. 
So as the point is, as Prabhu was very patient, we also have to be patient with the people who are coming after us, that we are trying to engage in Krishna consciousness. We have to also think of how did Prabhupada uh, engage with his early disciples? Was he fanatical? Are we fanatical? Are we thinking in terms that, you know, we know more than everybody else, or we know more than them? No, we have to be, we have to imbibe this quality, this mood of compassion. And when we take it on, miracles happen. Miracles do happen. He is without possession. 10. He works for everyone's benefit. For everyone's benefit. 11. He is very peaceful. 12. He is always surrendered to Krishna. 13. He has no material desires. 14. He is very meek. 15. He is steady. 16. He controls the senses. 17. He does not eat more than required. <laughs> this is one. That's another story. 18. He's not influenced by the Lord's illusory energy. Wow. That's a big one. He's not influenced by the Lord's illusory energy. 19. He offers respect to everyone. 20. He does not desire any respect for himself. See the two? They go hand in hand. It's one thing to offer respect to everyone. But then it's another thing, even internally, to think in terms of, well, they should be respecting me. I'm an older devotee. I'm a senior man. I'm blah, 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 and so on and so forth. He offers respect to her. He does not desire any respect for himself. 21. He is very grave. 22. He is merciful. 23. He is friendly. 24. He is poetic. 25. He is expert. And 26. He is silent. So what does that mean? You never speak? We're on a permanent position of monavrat? No. It means that when we speak, we speak only what is beneficial for ourselves, what is only beneficial for humanity, what is only beneficial for the world. And ultimately, when we speak, we speak only of Krishna and topics related to Krishna. That's what it means to be silent. Prabhupada used to see this man on the um, on the beach in Juhu every time he'd take one, he's standing there on one leg or whatever, or even upside down. I've seen that also on Juhu. People uh, doing this uh, yoga position, standing upside down, standing on one leg, one arm in the air, like Hirani Kashipu, when he was doing his uh, meditation, trying to get his benedictions from Brahmaji. But they would remain silent. Prabhupada said, this monavrata is, is useless. You know, vacha vegam, manasakroda vegam, control the tongue. How do you control the tongue? By taking prasadam and by speaking only topics related to spiritual life. That's how we control the tongue. And what topic is not related to spiritual life? Everything is related to spiritual life. Whether it's psychology, whether it's philosophy, whether it's politics, whether it's agriculture, whether it's education, everything is connected with Krishna. Provided we see and find a way, if we don't see it, we go around and we try to find a way that makes whatever we're doing connected with Krishna. And everything, every word is a, every word is a song in the spiritual world, and every step is a dance. So this this is the this is the life of, of spirituality. Every word is a song, every step is a dance. This is the spiritual world. And we are, believe it or not, we're living in the spiritual world, we're engaging with this philosophy. That's our life. And if we're that much divorced from the reality of what it should be, then we have to question which direction am I going? Do I need an, a, an assessment or a reassessment of what I'm doing? How dedicated am I? Am I going through the motions? How much, to what extent, Prabhupada says, uh, to what extent have I taken on these qualities of a devotee? Have I taken on any of them? Have I taken on one even? Everything can be measured. 
And we, I remember in the early days, uh, in, around Gorpurnim time, particularly on the Gorpurnim day, we were taught as young bhaktas that on the Gorpurnim day, you can assess yourself and give a, a, a an assessment of what you have achieved in the previous year and give that to Lord Chaitanya. Lord Chaitanya, I've I've come this far. I'm this much lacking. I've made these many mistakes. It's kind of like in the in the Catholic sense, a confessional, but you're doing it as an assessment of what you've achieved over the last year or how far you've gone back over the last year in terms of taking on these qualities of a devotee and and how how do you because we have to measure ourselves otherwise we just drift along aimlessly even in spiritual life that we that that's exactly what we'll get some aimless or some uh, esoteric notion of what we should be achieving but it's spiritual life is not like that it's solid it's practical it works so it's a part of our daily life. We take it in, and even in a subconscious way, it becomes a part of our nature. We don't uh, we don't any longer uh, do something that's muchi, and then go and do something that's supposed to be suchi. You you immediately wash your hands when you've eaten, and uh, you know you you, you don't you, it it just becomes second nature. It's just something that you do. Whereas um, whereas in, in the material world. You know, you go into a, <laughs> I, I, I don't want to be too gross. You go into a public toilet, you see people using the toilet and they walk straight out the door. I mean, there's no, there's not even a thought, you know, oh, I should go to the sink or maybe wash. No, it doesn't, I mean, for a devotee, this is, is inconceivable. So here in these 26 qualities, we have a description of the completely surrendered devotee. With such definitive information and criteria available, there's no room for speculation. That's the problem. When you read, the, when we read the scriptures, there's no no longer any room for speculation. And yet, even as devotees, we still go on speculating in our lives. So, who is surrendered? Who is not surrendered? This is fairly starkly realized when we engage in reading scriptures and we read a list such as this. I was, uh, I was listening to Srila Prabhupada uh, a few days ago and he was talking about uh, Lord Vishnu, Lord Narayan in terms of Vishnu Tattva. And it was very, it was fascinating. Prabhupada goes through all the qualities of the Vishnu Tattvas he goes through the qualities of uh, Lord Shiva. He goes through the qualities of uh, a, a devotee, and he goes through the qualities of uh, a karmi. And it's, it was interesting that um, Vishnu Tattva, Lord Narayan, has ninety-four percent of the qualities of Krishna. Even Lord Narayan, Lord Vishnu, he doesn't reach the level of Krishna. I was like, ah. Oh, of course, we know Lord Vishnu, Lord Narayan is non-different from Krishna. But at the same time, there is a difference. And Krishna has that much more qualities that the other manifestations, the other avatars who are expansions of Krishna, they don't have. And that was like, that was like, wow, fascinating, absolutely fascinating. And uh, Prabhupada went down, went through the whole list of all of them, and it's 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 in, the more the more we open up, the more we want to receive this message, the more we are inclined to hear, the more we can take in. But we have to have a willingness. We have to have a willingness to want to do it, and take on these qualities, and not only take them on, not only read them off like like it's a list or read a shloka, like we know so many shlokas, those things are wonderful. Reading lists from the, from the scriptures is wonderful. But to what extent am I in a position to say faithfully, honestly to myself, how much of this have I imbibed? How much of this do I put into practice? And it's fine if, we've, if we 
come to the realization where we say, well, not quite. I haven't really reached that level yet. Then, then we pray, we pray, and we pray. Please, Krishna, help me. I need, I need, I can't do this alone. And we can't. But it's not that we are alone. We're not alone. First of all, we have the uh, super soul sitting in our hearts, guiding us at every moment in time. But do we turn to the super soul? Do we turn to the disciple succession? Do we turn to the guru? Or do we turn to Maya? The choice is completely in our hands. It's not like somebody else is putting a gun to our head and saying, well, if you don't love Krishna, I'm going to kill you. That's not love. It doesn't work. Love doesn't work like that. Love doesn't work on, on, on coercion. It doesn't work on hate. It doesn't work on obligation. It, it works on love. And when we want, just like we can love our family, we can love our friends, we can love our, our children, our parents, whatever, husband or wife, that love is just an infinitesimal fraction of the love that is this anam, this bliss that is contained when we actually engage with the supreme love, supreme deity, Krishna. Just like when, um, as we, we read in a few weeks ago, we were reading about the... Um, the meeting of the gopis and uh, the residents of Brindavan with Krishna and Balaram at Kurukshetra. And uh, how when uh, Rukmini was talking with Rohini and all the queens in Dwarka were having their discussion and Krishna slipped away and he went to see the gopis who were his heart. This is his heart. So he goes to see the gopis and and the gopis are lamenting, you, you just left us, and they're all complaining. And, you know, the Rukmini, Rohini, they're worshipping Krishna with chamras and fans and everything on reverence and so on and so forth. But the gopis, they're chastising Krishna. And what does Krishna say? He said, yes, you're, you're right. He just, he holds his hands up. He said, what can I do? I was dragged away. I had these duties to fulfill. And uh, how on earth can I ever repay you? And what did Krishna say to the gopis? The only way I can repay you is by the service that you're rendering to me. This is the ultimate, the service you render to me. That's your payment. He gave Sudama, Brahman, all the riches in the world. He kidnapped Rukmini and he made her a queen. But the gopis, he said, I, I can't give you anything. I can give you nothing. I can offer you nothing. I can offer you the whole of existence. It's not enough. The only thing I can offer you is the, your service that you're rendering to me as payment. So this is the ultimate. This is what Krishna, Krishna is bereft. He's like a poverty stricken beggar in terms of what he can offer to the gopis. He's nothing to offer them except service. So this is the ultimate, the service and the faith in the transcendental service of Godhead. This is what is, this is the real essence, the secret, if it's not even a secret, the, the confidential knowledge, the ninth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, is nothing confidential about it. It's there for everybody to read. But it is confidential unless you break through that, that uh, barrier that stops us, that holds back the mind from, from getting onto the real essence of what is the reality of spiritual life. It's available to all of us. It's available to the gopis. It's available to all of us. The good qualities of the demigods are automatically displayed in the character of a pure devotee. It is not that he says one thing and does another. So there is no question of acting or posing in devotional service. And this is a fact. And if we are acting or if we're posing, whatever the case may be, then who are we posing or who are we acting? Who are we fooling? We're fooling ourselves. So it's best to come down to the reality of who we are, look in the mirror, analyze ourselves, analyze our objectives, analyze our motivation, 
analyze our goals if we have set goals and we would all like to think that we have goals to set and we'd all like to recognize or realize how far we have come and how far we have yet to come and what is the gap between what we are today and what we would like to be and there's nothing wrong with having that gap we all have that gap but at least we should be conscious that there is a gap and we would like to take it step by step forward and we're going forward at least we're not going backwards a, f a sincere person prabhat says who follows this method of sadhana bhakti is far better situated a person who realizes who is honest with himself is honest with herself that i've come this far but i've this far to go this far better situated than the false pretender who adopts show bottle spiritualism to cheat the innocent public a sincere sweeper in the street Prabhupada says is far better than the charlatan meditator who meditates only for the sake of making a living. And I was quoting Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Maharaj, who said the same thing. In the 11th canto, Ashrima Bhagavatam, um, Lord Krishna tells Uddhava, one should know the Acharya as myself and never disrespect him in any way. One should not envy him, thinking him an ordinary man, for he is the representative of the demigods. So, Prabhupada gives the example in, um, in a purport, and I think it's the fifth, fifth canto. Um, although crocodiles are very fierce animals, they are powerless when they venture out of the water onto land. When they're out of the water, they cannot exhibit their original power. Similarly, the all-pervading super soul Paramatma is the source of all living entities and all-pervading Vasudeva, the personality of Godhead. When the living entity remains in contact with the all-pervading Vasudeva, the personality of Godhead, he manifests his spiritual power. See, this is this is so important. It, it, it sounds like a like a throwaway line that we can just disregard, but when we come in contact with Vasudev, the original Supreme Personality of Godhead, we can only then can we manifest who we really are. Everything else is a shadow or a pretense or false. It's not that, it's not that the, the, the body is false, it's not that the material world is false, but because we identify with it as being permanent, then it has to be considered to be false because our identification with it is is one of permanence it's not exactly as the crocodile exhibits his strength in the water Prabhupada says the greatest of the living entity can be perceived when he is in the spiritual world that's the only time we can exhibit who we really are when we are in the spiritual world and that means now today not some esoteric idea of uh, leaving the body and then going to the spiritual world and then going to Vaikuntha. It happens today. Prabhupada said in a lecture in, uh, in Adelaide in Australia, where well, somebody from the audience challenged him that, uh, you know, can you, can you show me God and all this kind of stuff? And, and can you reach, and Prabhupada answered that, I was like, would you know who God is if I showed you God? In order to understand what is gold, you have to know what gold is. If I show you a piece of brass and I tell you it's gold, how will you know if you don't know what the, what the gold is? So if I show you God, yes, I can show you God. But if I show you God, will you know? So the prophet says, if you want, you can become completely and totally qualified in a second. Prabhupada said in a second. It's not like it's some esoteric thing that belongs to uh, the, the descriptions of the pure devotees in the Bhagavatam. This is our birthright. It's our birthright. So if we really want to engage with who we are, we really want to get out of this life of anxiety, just take to the process. 
that's all we have to do and and measure ourselves don't go along like be driven by the wind like uh arjun describes in uh, in bhagavad gita like a riven cloud just blowing here and there by the wind many householders Prabhupada goes on to say although well educated in knowledge of the veda become attached to family life they're compared here to the crocodiles out of water for they are devoid of all spiritual strength it doesn't mean that you know we just give up family life and just renounce and walk away and just negate our responsibilities that's that's not the point but we have to understand it's all temporary the greatness is that it's like that of a husband and wife who though uneducated praise one another and become attracted to their own temporary beauty this kind of greatness is appreciated only by low-class men with no qualifications everyone should therefore seek the shelter of the supreme soul the source of all living entities no one should waste his time in the so-called happiness of materialistic household life these are harsh harsh words but this is to wake us up when we're in a dream and we're having a nightmare and we're shouting and screaming in the, in, the, in the night and we're being attacked by a lion or whatever and your husband or your wife will shake you wake you then you realize oh wow it was a dream but you're sweating your heart is beating the dream was a reality for you it was happening it was the real deal but it's not you're lying in bed perfectly safe perfectly content okay nothing is attacking you there's no lion in your bedroom or no tiger tearing your face off you're dreaming it's the same with this so-called reality that we're living now it's a phantasmagoria a will of the wisp as Prabhupada would call it it's not it's not the reality it doesn't give us shelter it brings nothing but anxiety as wonderful and all as it is i engage with my children with my gan with my grandchildren all the time it brings me nothing but pleasure and i love it and they engage with me and uh, you know it's 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 wonderful i mean it's you couldn't ask for a better life but it's not the end all and be all of life there is more beyond that and we have to eventually learn to detach ourselves from this temporary world that's the goal of life in the vedic civilization Prabhupada says this type of crippled life is allowed only he's talking about materialistic household life materialistic household life not grihasta grihasta is different it's not materialistic so we have to make that distinction all the ashrams they're all spiritual whether you're sannyasi, you agree, has to brahmachari, vanapras, they're all spiritual. But if we're engaging with them in such a way, whether we're sannyas, we want prestige, adoration, distinction, whatever the case may be, or agree, has to, you want sense gratification, that's a completely different thing. Then that's materialistic. So it's not that the ashram itself is abominable. It's not. Probably speaking of materialistic household life. So he goes on to say, in Vedic civilization, this type of crippled life, crippled, probably describes it as crippled, is allowed only until one's 50th year. <laughs> you know, I'm in my 70s. Here I am. What to do? When must, one must give up family life and enter either the order of Vanaprast, independent retired life for cultivation of spiritual knowledge or sannyas, to renounce order in which one completely takes shelter of the supreme personality of godhead so what was maharaj pariksha doing he was driving away kali the personification of irreligiosity so we have to understand what is religion not be sentimental about it we really do have to take stock of where we are at and where we're going and what our motivation is, what our objectives are, and really what do we want to get out of this process of spiritual life that we're engaging in now, not just scratching it at the bottle. 
as Prabhupada used to say, licking the jar of honey from the outside, we'll never get the taste of honey. We can't just go through the motions of spirituality, but we don't really make that surrender. It does take a surrender. It really does. But it's not like it's, it's, it's painful. It's glorious. The first indication of anyone who's engaging in spiritual life, what is the first indication? Brahma says it so many times. He's always happy. He's always happy. Look at Haridas Thakur, beaten every marketplace, but Lord Chaitanya took the took the pain. Lord Chaitanya took the wounds. So we're we're um, we're followers of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Gora Bhakta Brinda. So why waste the time? It's a a wonderful opportunity. Let's not throw it away. I didn't know it was seven o'clock. Hmm, sorry about that. It's uh, time for questions. If we have any questions, we might have. Maybe Kutika might allow us 30 seconds for questions. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Pure Prabhuji, even we didn't realize that it was seven o'clock till you saw and mentioned that we were all immersed in the Leela Amrita and every time you speak, uh, we learn so much. So thank you, thank you for making yourself available and uh, doing all these research and then uh, giving it to us um, in such an easy palatable form. Um, this is really spoon feeding and we are all enjoying it. Thank I'd, you. I'd like to... Uh, Welcome Shivan Shankar, who have joined uh, this group for the first time. So thank you, uh, Shivangi, for joining yeah. us. Uh, let us all uh, welcome her to the group by chanting three Hari Bowls. So uh, yeah. please uh, feel free to join this group um, every day uh, at the same time, uh, same link. Hari Bowl. Hari Bowl. Hari Bowl. Shivani, is it possible? Shivangi, is it possible to uh, switch on your video so we can uh, have your darshan? So if we met on the road somewhere, we can at least know you. And if not possible, it's okay. So I open it up to uh, questions and comments. Are there any questions or comments? Okay, we have exhausted our time, so I think uh, we will leave the questions for next time. Uh, he is traveling next week to Kenya, so a lot of you will be able to have an interaction with him personally. Um, uh, Prashanatma Prabhu, is it possible for you to end this session today? Hare Krishna. Okay, in that case, I can, I can end the session today. So thank you very much, Prabhuji, for this wonderful session. Thank you. Uh, and uh, we look forward to your next class from Kenya. Uh, next week, we'll be having uh, um, the whole week, it will be Atul Krishna Maharaj. And then um, uh, the last three days will Maha uh, Prasad Prabhuji. So it's going to be exciting Srimad Bhagavatam class. Uh, again, same on Zoom, but they'll meet. Um, uh, physically, but we'll uh, join in virtually as well. Yeah, so, and I'll be and I'll be meeting both of them when I go there. And uh, I'm really looking forward to that very yeah. much. That's good. That's good. So uh, on uh, Monday, uh, Atul Krishna Prabhuji will be in Eldoret. Uh, so Monday to Thursday, he's there. So maybe we'll see you as well uh, on Wednesday once you reach. Mm -hmm. uh, or uh, any other time, but um, you you are still in our schedule for the week after. So uh, I hope that you'll be able to make it while in Kenya. Yes, yes. Uh, I'll make a point. Okay, so let's uh, thank Prabhuji um, uh, with chanting of um, the Mahamantra once. 
Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Krishna Krishna. Hare Hare. Hare Hare. Hare Hare. Thank you very much. Good night, everybody. Haribol. Haribol. Thank you.